Welcome back everyone to MAE 170. This is lecture 16 in week number nine. So last time we saw the design of a phase lead compensator in the frequency domain. Now we're gonna do the same, that is solve the same problem that we saw last time, but using a phase lag compensator. So we saw that in the designing of a phase lead compensator, we use the increase of phase actively in order to increase the phase margin. Of course, the side effects were that one, the crossover frequency moved to the right, that is to higher frequencies. And second, for higher frequencies, we are adding some gain. Now, when we're designing a phase lag compensator in the frequency domain, we're kind of doing the opposite. We are using the opposite strategy. That is, we're actively exploiting the drop in high frequency gain in order to move the crossover frequency deliberately to the left where the phase margin is going to be high enough in order to meet our requirement. And the drop in phase is gonna be just a side effect, but we can always design the drop in phase so that it's is to very low frequency. So it's not going to affect the overall phase margin at all. Now, after this nice speech, let's actually see how this looks like. It's gonna be much clearer once we see it in practice. So recall that the plant that we designed or that we were given was five over S times S plus five. So we have one pole at the origin and one pole at minus five. And then we selected a gain of 50 in order to meet the requirement in terms of steady state error. So with a gain of 50, the steady state error to a ramp input was 0 0.02, which is exactly at the boundary of the requirement. Now, the other requirement that we want to fulfill is that the phase margin needs to be greater than 48 degrees. We've already seen that, this is just a repetition of what we saw last time, if we draw the body plot for the uncompensated system, we see that the actual phase margin that we have is only about 18 decibels. Sorry, not decibels, but degree rather. And this occurs at a frequency that is the crossover frequency of 15.42 radians per second. Now the strategy for designing the lag compensator is to pinpoint the frequency at which we would have a phase margin of whatever we want, in this case, 48 degrees. So if we take a look at the body plot for the phase, we see that we have a, a, a difference between the phase plot and the minus 180 degree line of 48 degrees, a little bit towards the left with respect to the actual phase margin. But this 48 degrees does not represent the phase margin because if we then go up, the magnitude plot does not cross the zero decibel line at that frequency. So ideally, we, will, we would want to drop the magnitude so that it would pass through the zero decibel line at the frequency that uh, at which we have a phase, or we would have a phase margin of 48 degrees. So again, here is the, the reasoning is kind of the opposite. Let's see on the phase plot where the 48 degree phase margin would be. And instead of you know, increasing the actual phase margin, let's drop the magnitude so that it crosses, it will cross the zero, zero decibel line at the ideal crossover frequency. So 
So what is such frequency? Well, it is easily um, computable because all we have to do is we have to take the phase of our uncompensated system and then we have to add the 180 degrees and we want this to be equal to 48 degrees. Again, this 48 degrees is a difference. It's a difference between the actual phase of the uncompensated system and the minus 180 degrees. So technically here, we would have minus minus 180. It's a difference, but of course, minus and minus is a plus. So we have that the phase of the uncompensated system plus 180 is 48 degrees. In this case, or by doing so, we're going to find the frequency that is omega, the corresponding omega at which this occurs, which if the plot is accurate, is gonna be slightly less than five radians per second. So let's do so. Um, here to the right, I rewritten the plant transfer function in the frequency domain that is using the omega. So we can easily calculate the phase, starting with the phase corresponding to 50. Well, that is just a positive real number. So the phase is zero. Now let's go to the denominator. We have minus our, ten minus our tangent of omega over zero. We've already seen this thing in the exact same expression last time. So I'm going to go a little bit faster. And we have minus our tangent of 0 0.2 omega divided by one. And we want this to be equal to 48 minus 180, that is minus 132 degrees. So we're left with minus 90 minus our tangent of 0 0.2 omega equals minus 132. And so we have that 0 0.2 omega has to be equal to tangent of 42 degrees. Therefore, the ideal crossover frequency would be 4.5 radians per second. So our intuition was correct. It is slightly less than five radians per second. So now if this 4.5 radians per second was the crossover frequency, well, then the phase margin would be exactly the 48 degrees that we are looking for. However, this is not the crossover frequency. So can we somehow lower the magnitude plot? Yes, we can, because you go back to lecture 15 and take a look at the structure magnitude wise of the phase lag compensator, you'll see that it has a tail for higher frequencies in which it drops the magnitude. And the magnitude is actually dropped by a quantity of 20 logarithm of alpha. So knowing of how much we want to drop, we can calculate alpha. So what is the amount of decibels or magnitude that we want to drop the body plot? Well, we have to calculate it. We want to calculate such distance in decibels. So how do we do that? Well, we simply have to compute the magnitude at 4.5 radians per second. So let's do so. What is 20 logarithm of the magnitude of G computed at 4.5? See, in this design, everything is kind of straightforward. There's not really um, 
we're not going to find uh, quadratic or biquadratic equations. Right, so now we need a real part squared, so it's just one plus imaginary part squared. So we have 0 0.04 times 4.5 squared. So this is equal to 18.3 decibels. So the distance right here, which we want, we would like to drop the magnitude plot is of 18.3 decibels. So all you need to do now is to equate the tail of the lag compensator, that is 20 logarithm of alpha, with whatever we want to drop. So it's minus 18.3 decibels. I'm going to round it up to 20 just to be safer. Again, this is an arbitrary uh, choice. Uh, you might not want to do that, or, or, or you might want to do that. <laughs> it depends. If you don't do this, um, and then you realize that at the end, you don't meet re your requirement, you can come back and repeat the step. So anyway, even for sake of uh, getting nice numbers, I'm going to round it. Uh, well, I should say down to minus 20 decibels, which implies that logarithm of alpha is equal to minus one or that alpha is equal to 0 0.1. So first check, this is a number less than one. So we're actually dealing with a lag compensator. Always, you know, double check these little things. Now we have alpha, but we're missing tau because in order to come up with the actual compensator, we need two parameters, alpha and tau. But before determining tau, let's see if this alpha is actually feasible to realize with just one compensator. And um, in order to do so, let's go ahead and calculate the maximum amount of phase that we're going to, that we end up subtracting using this compensator. So we have arc sine of alpha minus one over alpha plus one. And this will give you about minus 55 degrees, which is just at the limit of what I told you is realizable using just one compensator. You can at most add or at most subtract 55 degrees worth of phase with just one compensator. We are at the limit, we're fine. So know that if, if you're going to find an alpha that is less than 0 0.1, well then, um, it's not really realizable with just one compensator. Okay, so now what do we need to do? We just have to determine tau. Remember, tau is, once we determine tau, we're determining the location of the pole, and then consequently we have the location of the zero. Now here there's not a unique way of determining tau. However, as I mentioned earlier, we want to pick both zero and pole enough to the left so that the drop in phase does not interfere with the, with the new crossover frequency. So we don't want to cause the lag compensator, for instance, to have a, a drop of phase right here because then we'll ruin all our plans. If instead we could add a drop of phase that is you know, enough to the left in frequency wise, well, this is not going to interfere with our new uh, phase margin. In fact, 
Well, some of you might think, well, hold on a second. Here, this drop is dangerously close to the minus 180 line. True that, but the magnitude line is very, very far away from the zero decibel line. Remember that you want you you must have two conditions that are met at once for have to in order to have instability. The phase margin is defined only when the magnitude plot passes through the zero decibel line. So the zero decibel line will be crossed about a, this new ideal crossover frequency that we've designed or we are expecting to, to have, which is about 4.5 radians per second. Then we'll see it's not going to be exactly that, but it's going to be close enough. So it's definitely nowhere near uh, the very low frequencies at which we're planning to, um, to have our drop-in phase. So the drop-in phase, remember that the peak happens at the frequency omega m, which is the geometric mean between the frequency associated with the zero and the frequency associated with the pole. So it's gonna be in between. Therefore, what we really want is that both the frequency associated with the pole and the frequency associated with the zero, being a lag compensator, omega p is less than omega z, but both of them have to be less than our ideal crossover frequency, in this case, 4.5 radians per second. So that's really the only thing that we want. And then remember, as I said, omega p or sigma p, same thing, is one over tau, and uh, omega z is one over alpha tau. So we also have this inequality chain. Okay, so now let's get to how to actually determine these frequencies. Once again, here we have an arbitrary rule, which you might hate because there's not really a recipe, an exact recipe to follow, but for an engineer is actually very, very good because you have a little bit of freedom here. You cannot really do whatever you want, but you have just an indication. So the thought here, once again, is that omega z has to be much less than 4.5 or our ideal crossover frequency. What is much less? Do you remember what we did for the lag compensator in the, uh, using the root locus? We divided by 50. Let's do the same. So you don't have to remember two things. Let's divide this ideal frequency by 50. Again, 50, you can choose another number. You can choose 45. You can choose 100. It's not really a big deal. It's just a rule of thumb. Start with 50 and see what you get. So in this case, let's just choose 50, and we're going to get an omega z of 0 0.09 radians per second. Or, of course, since omega z is also equal to sigma z, we have the location of the zero. It's going to be at minus 0 0.09. Once we have this, and since omega z is equal to one over alpha tau, then tau is automatically determined because tau then becomes equal to one, one over alpha omega z. And so it's one over 0 0.1 times 0 0.09. Therefore, omega z, sorry, tau is 111.1111. We just uh, stop at the first decimal seconds. Once we have tau, the frequency associated with the pole is automatically found. So it's one over 101 over one periodic. And so this is 0 0.009 radians per second. The location of the pole is at minus 0 0.009. So here we have it. 
we have the lag compensator. Of course, we don't know yet if it works because we have to check. We have to check the new phase margin. We know for a fact that the steady state error requirement is met, but what about the new phase margin? You always want to uh, compute it and then double check that you're actually meeting the requirement because we don't know that. So in order to do so, uh, what you should do is to compute or actually draw, I should say, the compensated body plot. So here we have, as usual, the magnitude plot and the phase plot. And now we have both the uncompensated system in purple and in orange, the compensated system. So you see that if we take a look at the magnitude plot, we've dropped the magnitude, and this is what we were actively doing. We're dropping the magnitude, and the tail happens, you know, as soon as we are enough far to the right of the uh, both frequencies of the pole and the zero of the compensator, so that the new crossover frequency now has moved towards what we wanted. Remember, ideally we wanted 4.5. And we will see that um, by simulating it with MATLAB or just by calculating the phase margin with MATLAB for the same reason that I said last time, it's just because it becomes a little bit uh, too cumbersome to do everything by hand, but you could do that as well. But you can um, find that the new crossover frequency is 3.93 radians per second close enough to the 4.5. Again, it's not gonna be exactly the same. It doesn't really matter. What we're looking for here is the phase margin, not really the crossover frequency. So now that we have that 3.93 radians per second as the crossover frequency, let's take a look at what happens in the uh, regarding to the phase. That is, let's see uh, if the compensated phase margin is at least 48 degrees. Well, it happens to be even more to the left of the 48 that we were aiming for. So it's better because the phase margin, the requirement says the phase margin has to be at least 48 degrees. So if it is more, it's better. All right, so once again, via MATLAB, you can compute that this is 50.3 degrees. So you see here that uh, around the area frequency wise where the new crossover frequency is, the phase hasn't been altered because the drop in phase, as I explained earlier, has been designed to be enough to the left so that it does not interfere. So the phase plot for the compensated and uncompensated system for high frequencies they are the same. It's just for low frequencies that they're different. There's this drop in phase, but we don't care about this drop. It's gonna be quite irrelevant. All right, so just as a summary, we found a phase margin of 50.3 degrees. So it's greater than 48 at a new crossover frequency of 3.93 radians per second, which is slightly less than the uh, 4.5 that we originally, calculate, originally calculated, but it's definitely much less than the uncompensated crossover frequency. So you see here that um, we've solved the same problem using two kinds of compensators, a lead compensator and a lag compensator. For the uncompensated system, the one that I'm circling now, we had a phase margin of 18 degrees, not enough, which happened at a crossover frequency of 15.42 radians per second. Once we've introduced the compensator, well, now we have two choices. 
lead or lag. In terms of phase margin, they both um, meet the requirement, but they're different compensators, of course. Here I summarized the transfer function for the lead compensator and for the phase lag compensator. So we're gonna have for the lead compensator, again, just a summary of what we found last time, a maximum added phase of 45 degrees, an alpha of six and a tau constant or time constant of 0 0.0265 seconds, which lead to an overall phase margin of 48.3 degrees at a new crossover frequency of 30.9 radians per second. So we meet the phase margin requirement, but the crossover frequency has been raised. If we instead choose the other route, that is the phase lag compensator one, well, we're gonna have different characteristics. The minimum phase that we're subtracting is minus 55 degrees, alpha is 0.1, and the uh, constant, you see that it's 111.1, much higher. But for what we really care, that is for the phase margin, we meet the requirement. It is greater than 48 degrees. And once again here, the only uh, major difference is the fact that the crossover frequency has been uh, lowered to 3.93 radians per second. So although the requirements that we had have been met, we have two very different systems. The two compensator systems, compensated with a lead or with the lag compensators have different uh, performances. Just um, as a rule of thumb, the higher the crossover frequency is, the more responsive a system is. So here, what I did is just, I plotted the uh, step input response just to, uh, because that's, that's sort of the, um, the usual response that we look at in order to um, assess the responsiveness and the settling time and, and all the characteristics of the transient and the steady state of a system. So here we have three curves. So the blue one is for the uncompensated system. So we see that we have a very high uh, percent overshoot, a settling time of 1.46 seconds, and the rise time of 0 0.075 seconds. But we don't really care about the performance uh, of these kind of performance for the uncompensated system because we didn't meet the requirement in terms of phase margin. So we had to correct it. So now let's focus on the step response of the two compensated systems that we chose. Starting with the phase lead compensator, in red, um, we've reduced the rise time, we've reduced the settling time, uh, and we've also reduced the percent overshoot. So you see how much more responsive the system is. It gets to the steady state value that is one in, uh, in lower time, and then it also gets to the steady state value, so selling time is much lower. Now compare it to the response of the compensator system that uses a phase lag compensator here in, in yellow orangish. The rise time is larger and also the settling time is larger, although the settling time is still lower than the uncompensator one. So you see that the performance of the two compensator systems are different. Which one is better? Well, it depends. If it is just in terms of the phase margin, well, that's up to you. You can choose either, either or. If on top of the phase margin requirement, you also had a requirement, let's say in terms of rise time, you wanted your rise time to be less than 0.1 second, then you would go for a phase lead compensator. You see, it's, I'm giving you all the, ingredients, and then it's up to you to cook the perfect recipe for your system. You know, it, it all depends on your requirements 
and then how realizable uh, your design is. You know, there are many, many factors here. In the example that I showed you, it's always the it's obviously very minimal in terms of requirements. We cannot really see it too much of a complicated system. I think it's already, uh, there's already enough information for you to digest. So just keep in mind that in, in a real situation, a real problem, you're gonna have possibly way more than one requirement to meet. And perhaps you're not gonna meet all of them. So you have to compromise. There's always the, the problem with engineers. You know, you, you always have to compromise. Okay. That concludes the um, design of the phase lag compensator in the frequency domain. So I'm going to stop this video here, and then I'm going to um, upload another video for part two, in which we're going to talk about the uh, stability in the frequency domain, that is the Nyquist criterion.